every single time that you look at an object or, or a design, whether it's a, a virtual you know, digital product, you always need to sort of have an appreciation for the work and the time and the toil that went into it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Gravity Sketch Design Sync, a space to talk all things design. In this episode, we will be talking with John Morello about form fundamentals and the creative process involved in making good design. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Daniela. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I've, I watched the Robert Laszlo Kiss One uh, interview and I thought it was really, really interesting, very insightful. So thank you. I'm excited. I'm glad that you, you watched that one. Um, well, to start with, I think it, it would be great to hear a little bit about you and, and a bit about your journey on how did you end up becoming an industrial designer. Whenever you ask this question, it tends to have a really funny story or a really interesting story. And it usually starts when you're young. I'm not sure if that happened to you as well. Yes. So when I was a little kid, I wanted to pretty much be an inventor. And of course, like most people, I didn't know that industrial design was a thing. But when I was very little, I had a brother, he is eight years older than me, and he would always be building things like, you know, sailboats out of driftwood and, you know, airplanes out of aluminum foil and dowels and all this other stuff. And, you know, I was much younger than him. So actually, some of my earliest childhood memories are me watching him make these things and then usually when he'd go away he wouldn't let me touch them at the time when he was working on them and then when he'd go away i would uh, help him by basically well, i was actually trying to make it better but i would usually end up just destroying his stuff so that's how i got started um <laughs> i like to think that i got a lot better at design as i got older um that was when i was about three years old Another thing that's probably worth mentioning is that my brother actually studied industrial design. He ended up going into game design in the end, but that's what he studied uh, at Rhode Island School of Design. So I knew that there was this sort of career path that was very much related to making and building and designing. And then on top of that, my mother actually studied interior design as a second career. So. She was basically in banking prior to that, and I would say when I was about eight to ten years old, she studied interior design at New York School of Interior Design, and I would just watch her do her homework, and I'd always sit behind her, and she'd be doing like her color palette homework and stuff like that, and I would just basically, we'd, we'd have this little stool, and you know, she'd be sitting on the stool, and I'd actually, I was small enough that I could actually sit like behind her or stand like kind of perched like a little gargoyle or something behind her and like look over her shoulder and watch her do that homework and it was a similar thing like she'd go away to like get some water or something and then i would you know add my uh my two cents to it and completely ruin it she actually never told me that i ruined it she, she just said oh that's a great job john and then she'd have to start over with her homework <laughs> So yeah, that's how I got started, ruining my, my parents and my, my family's design work. Yeah, well, uh, you, you weren't, I mean, I'm glad that your mom never told you that you were ruining it. Um, I think it was her, her way of encouraging you to, to continue being creative. Yeah, I like to think so. And, you know, like I said, I did get a lot better at design later on. Um, I stopped ruining things. I still ruin things on occasion, don't get me wrong but it's much, much less common. And uh, with my clients, I make, make sure that they don't see the ruined projects. <laughs> I make sure that, you know, I only show them the successes. Um, of course, um, that's definitely a, a big part of design is, is sort of reducing risk for your clients. So that is something that I, I focused a lot on. And then, but there's also the other side of things where you kind of want to, you know, take risks, but usually, Companies usually won't pay you to do that. You usually have to do that on your own. And then once they see that it's a success, then you get paid to do that kind of stuff. That's right. You know, like to, to design, to make, to innovate, you need to be making some mistakes. You know, it's, it's not that you're going to be right the first time. And it, it's something that um, people still need to understand. That's a great point. I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize about industrial design or when they look at an object, they don't realize that there is a team of people that had to develop this. Like, you know, Gravity Sketch, for example. 
they just assume that this user interface is you know beautifully designed it all makes sense everything just works it was not i i don't even need to ask you to know that it was not easy to get to that point because you know i've i've built enough things to know so I think every single time that you look at an object or, or a design, whether it's a, a virtual you know, digital product, you always need to sort of have an appreciation for the work and the time and the toil that went into it, and not just the project itself. So there's the toil that went into the project itself, but then there's also all of the toil that led up to that point. So you know, I started out ruining all of my family's designs, and then gradually I stopped ruining things and started <laughs> making actual money for these clients. Um, and that was a process that took pretty much my entire life from when I was three years old until now. So what is that? It's almost 30 years basically that I've, I've been designing and it's probably the same thing with you. I mean, you started this, uh, you started this company at Royal College of Art and it was highly conceptual and then gradually it sort of, sort of turned into this huge crazy thing. And, and by the way, I have a lot of good things to say about gravity sketch especially the vr app full disclosure daniela is not asking me to say this and she's not paying me anything i'm not this is my opinion and my opinion only i think it's an amazing app i started using it a lot more in depth over the weekend and i was just absolutely blown away so good job on that oh thanks john yeah i'm, I'm definitely not paying john yet no <laughs> <laughs> that's really true that most designers, most creatives don't start becoming that person, you know, the minute that they start studying in college and so on, right? They start very early on, almost like whenever they ended up like being able to just communicate and express themselves in some way or another. What you're mentioning, like, is a really good indicator of a person's future success in the field. Now, that's not to say that you can't get started later on in your life. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're making things at a very early age, that's a very good sign that you'll be a great designer. Um, that, I'm not saying that you can't be a, good, a great designer if, if you don't do that, but that's a really, really strong indicator. And it's interesting because you know people are intuitively, I mean, design is a very intuitive process, right? I mean, people just sort of do it um, when they're kids all the time. Kids build things out of Play-Doh or Legos or whatever else constantly. Um, it's just sort of uh, beaten out of you over time. Your creativity and, and uniqueness is slowly just like beaten out of you over time. Time. It's actually funny. So when I was a little kid, uh, I was not a very good student, which is funny because I'm, I'm a teacher now at CCA. <laughs> but I was not a good student. I got good grades, but I was extremely disruptive because I was really bored all the time. But basically, uh, I remember there was this... Uh, girl who sat across from me. I remember her name, but I won't say it on, on the podcast. I remember her name. And basically they would reward us for good behavior or, you know, no disruptions or, you know, just being a generally good student with these little star stickers when I was a kid. And uh, I was, I think I was eight years old. I remember this girl had probably a hundred and more than a hundred little multicolored star stickers on her desk and you'd stick it on your desk in like this really neat little row and <laughs> she had well over a hundred over the course of the year and i remember by the end of the year i think i had like five like i had five little stickers and then i had this girl that was sitting across with from me with over a hundred of them and it was just like i think that was when i realized like man i am not <laughs> cut out for this for this whole like I don't even know what it is but I, I feel like design is much more divergent and you know a lot of other disciplines are much more structured and regimented and that's kind of when I realized I, I didn't know that I was going to be a designer but I realized like I got to figure something out because I am not good at this <laughs> I think I, I relate to the to your story and I, I wonder if it's something that a lot of designers go through right being the being the person that you know, you, you, you get bored with the education system that we have at the moment and you're not, you know, earning the rewards and the, like the prices that all the rest of the other kids that are like really good at that education system are getting. Um, and then at some point, like you start thinking, how's my life going to be 
if I'm not cut for any of this. And then until you realize and then you start studying design or start, you know, doing going in that creative route and you realize there's there's a whole other world that actually fits with who you are. Yeah, that's exactly right. You just need to figure out what your what your niche is. And it's interesting because at least for me, I knew that I wasn't cut out for that, but there was n I never had any doubt about my abilities. Um, I always knew that I, w I was skilled at what I was skilled at. Um, I never, I, 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 I never really doubted that even now. I mean, I have definitely, you know, thought about, you know, alternative paths within the career of design for sure. But uh, my skill was never what was in question. Maybe, I don't, I don't know what that means, but I knew what I was good at, I, th I think is the main point of this. And I, I think intuitively everybody knows what they're good at. Um, it, it might not be something that is immediately uh, viewed as valuable to society, but it's up to you to basically figure out how to make yourself valuable and, and contribute to society. So more specifically, like, here's how you can think of it. I was talking to my uh, buddy Rafi about this, and he said, you know, everybody is looking for this traditional industrial design job, but, you know, Raymond Lowy wasn't looking for a traditional industrial design job. He invented industrial design, or, you know, of course, a bunch of other other bunch of other people did too, but, you know, Raymond Lowy invented his own career. Uh, Buckminster Fuller invented his own career. Charles and Ray Eames, once again, they didn't like look for a job that suited their own skills. They made their own job, which I think is really important to think about. Now, this is hard. This is much harder than following uh, an established path, like becoming a doctor or a lawyer or all of those things. Um, so you're going to meet a fair bit of resistance and maybe maybe i'm sort of thinking about it now maybe the fact that i i did have that unwavering faith in my abilities is is kind of what helped me persist through it because for a very long time there was no indication that <laughs> i was going to be successful in this field it like it, i i knew that i was i knew what i was good at but there was no guarantee it's not like oh I graduate medical medical school and I get good grades and then I get I do my residency and then I'm a doctor. It would, it's not like that. So I think that's definitely something to think about as a creative. Like, what is the career that you're going to create? How are you going to design your life, basically? And designing your life because it it does become your life, right? You don't stop. You don't go. You don't. You're not a designer from nine to five. You're a designer the whole time your brain is constantly thinking about how to improve the world, how to make it better for, for everyone. Let's talk a little bit about how you started thinking about how to build your career, how to build your life. Um, and I, I remember you telling me that you, you at some point realized that there was a way in which you could almost analyze design and understand what would make a good design and bad design. This actually does relate back to just knowing your strengths. So one thing that I, I know that I'm pretty good at is the ability to take pretty complex ideas or, or sort of suss out a situation and just get right to the point about what's good about it or what's happening. Um, so that is basically what I've relied on. Uh, basically a lot of designers are much more intuitive and they have difficulty putting their thoughts into words. Like a lot of designers, uh, myself included when I was younger, tend to know that they like something but not know why or not like something and, and not know why. So they don't fully understand what's good about a design or what's bad about it. So. That is one thing that I've spent a lot of time sort of working on. So how do you look at a product? How do you analyze it and figure out what's good about it so that you can apply it to your own work? Of course, you know, you don't just copy it. You, you, if you understand it deeply, you'll not be copying it because you'll be able to add your own sort of expression to that uh, design and make it your own. So really sort of analyzing it and breaking it down is really, really helpful for me. And I think that's been pivotal in sort of 
establishing myself as a designer and communicating my value to clients. So that's a really big deal. If you can't express why a design is valuable or how it's going to make this company money, they're not going to care about it. So if I can basically express like, okay, um, let's look at something around here. This, this pen, all right, this pen is shaped this way because it fits the contours of your hand. That's sort of an objective feature. But, you know, there's a clear delineation between these surfaces in terms of color, and that is to highlight this logo. So it's black against white. That's really, really high contrast, right? So they want you to look at that logo. Um, the color scheme is a bit odd in my opinion. It's a little bit jarring. I might have gone with a more neutral tone be considering that you want a pen to be a tool that you use for expression, right? Whether you're writing, drawing, or whatever else. So you kind of actually want this to fall into the background and, and this color doesn't really. But at the same time, uh, maybe because it's on a desk, it's easy to spot when you have a bunch of like white paper all over the place. It's really, really easy to see it. So like. I can't, like this, I can't show these images probably. I'll show you, no, I can't show that. I was gonna show you some of the sketches on my desk, but they're under NDA, like basically it's a mess. So if, if I have this little blue pen that really stands out, that sort of helps to uh, identify where it is as I'm drawing and creating. So look, I sort of thought out loud about this. Usually I'd be a, a lot more structured about my sort of analysis if I was actually presenting it to somebody uh, like a client but sort of thinking about products in that way and, and sort of analyzing the discrete objective features and then making inferences or subjective analyses from those objective features is a really, really good way to get good at design really fast because you can't be drawing all the time. You can't be sketching constantly, like you have to sleep. But if you're sitting in a doctor's office, you can be looking at the tables and analyzing them. You know, you, you can, be going on a walk and analyzing every single plant. Um, I think it was Socrates who said the unexamined life is not worth living. And I agree 100%. You need to sort of reflect on things on a micro scale, like looking at the products, but you also need to reflect on your career as a designer on a macro scale. So, you know, what am I doing with my life basically? What am I trying to accomplish here? Um, what are the objective qualities of my daily routine and how is it informing my future? So those are all things that I like to think about. Now, I know that a lot of designers don't like this method because they feel that it takes the soul out of creation, but I disagree because I have a huge catalog of things to draw from in my head if I'm designing something. It's like endless. Like I, I, I connect all of these things so easily. It wasn't easy at first, but now I can connect all of these things so easily because all I do is, is constantly look at stuff. You know, like you said, you know, a lot of people design from nine to five. I'm designing constantly. I'm constantly looking at everything. Like I have these really nice plants right here. I'll show you. I'm looking at this plant right now and I really like the way that, uh, I really like the way that these, this uh, leaf sort of diverges from the stem. It's really interesting. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but I think that's really cool. And the way that it sort of drapes down is really interesting because it's actually trying to reach the sun, which is, there's a window right here. So all of that stuff is just cool. And I have no idea where it's going to actually have practical application. It's all just data. It's all just information. And then eventually you can sort of connect all of these pieces together in order to create your next design. That's how this all starts. So yeah, that was a, a long explanation, but it was a very involved sort of analysis or very involved question. So thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Probably everyone, every, every designer, every creative ends up doing that, but maybe they're not conscious of what they're doing. Right. But it is important what you're saying that, you know, do it on purpose, go through life, observing things, understanding how a plant, uh, you know, the different shapes that a plant has and why is that? And, Will that be necessary? Like, will that be useful for you in the future when you're designing something? Maybe, or maybe not. But it might make you think about something else. I've been uh, reading about you a little bit. You're a musician and you're a surfer as well. And these are, even though they're not shapes that you're observing through life, you are living all these different um, experiences that might also determine how your design is done. 
Is that true? Like, are you, do you take inspiration from those other things that you do? Yes. So there's a couple things here. You mentioned that all designers do this subconsciously. I agree 100%. Um, not only do all designers do this subconsciously, but all people do this subconsciously. They're just not thinking about it. So you need to be conscious of it as a designer so that you can sort of manage these subconscious expectations that your customer is having. So that's why it's so important. Like I said, the unexam I didn't say it. Like Socrates said, the unexamined life is not okay. worth living. In terms of, you know, my personal passions and hobbies, I like to keep them I like to keep surfing especially a little bit more personal only because it's one of those things that uh I've been doing for a very very long time. Um and it absolutely informs my design process, but to it's hard for me to describe it in a way that makes sense to people. That's the one thing that's really, really difficult for me to describe because it's so incredibly nuanced. Like, here's, here's one way to think about it. I'll, I will give you an ultra simplified example. So if you think about even where waves come from, they're essentially generated by wind that travels over the ocean over thousands of miles and they start as these little tiny ripples and then they gradually turn into these giant you know three four five meter like concentrations of energy basically and then they start to feel the surface as the you know as the bottom of the ocean gets shallower and shallower they start to feel the bottom of that surface and the top of the wave is still going at a certain speed and the bottom of the wave is starting to slow down as it starts to feel that that energy starts to feel the surface and then that is what causes the wave to break i have i don't know exactly how that informs my design process but i guarantee you it does and in terms of music i mean here's an example when you're singing um here here's something that's kind of interesting if you're singing you know, people think that if you sort of open your throat up like this, uh, it helps to sort of change the timbre of your voice, and it does. But you actually hear it hear it in your own head more than um, more than the audience does. So if you actually want to get more projection from your voice, what you do is you actually bring your tongue forward a little bit in your mouth like this, like that. And what that does is it opens the airway even more than just sort of talk just sort of talking like this. And if you do that, it allows you to project your voice out more because now the path of resistance is out in the front of your mouth rather than the back. So analyzing this stuff, I have no idea how it applies to design, but just the fact that you're thinking about this, you'll start to make connections. So I was watching this like goat meme of these goats screaming and they do the same thing with their mouths when they yell, they stick their tongue out when they, when they bleat. So I don't know where that's going to play into my design process, but you just have to have faith that all of this information that you're taking in is going to apply somewhere. Um, as an example, I did a coral lighting collection a little while ago just for fun, and that was heavily inspired by the ocean and, and the beauty of, of the ocean and waves, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't think that there was any commercial viability to them. Um, I 3D printed a few of them and, you know, they're really cool looking. And if you want, you know, I, you can leave a link in the description or something. But the point of this is that, like, that was directly informed by my surfing. Um, that was a project that I made. And then I ended up doing a professional project that used and showcased a lot of that skill set. It was, like, directly applicable. So you just don't know where this stuff is going to come in handy. But the more data that you have and the more that you analyze these things consciously and the more you really try to understand what's going on, the better off you're going to be as a designer, without a doubt. Because the basis of all design starts from inspiration, I think. Yeah, and you need to be collecting all these different data to be able to just express yourself at the end of the day that's what makes you you right and that's why we're not robots like designers are not robots that are like making the same thing there's something unique about each designer and you they're expressing it through their through their work through the products that they're making uh, i see it you know like you you 
you definitely take a lot of time in like thinking how you are analyzing the world. Probably not a lot of people do it or, or maybe in a less uh, dramatic way. Um, in my case, for example, it's always travel. Like traveling is the thing that brings me all these different libraries of experiences and understanding how people behave in different situations. For me, it's all about really analyzing and understanding how people act and behave. And that's what I take and use for my creative process. I 100% agree with you on that. I think travel is an incredibly uh, valuable thing to do. And the reason why I think it's so valuable, this is another thing that uh, my friend Rafi taught me. He says that, you know, the reason why travel is so valuable is because it takes you out of your normal context and you have no choice but to really examine and try to understand what's going on all around you. Because, you know, when you're in your normal context, your normal everyday situations, you take everything for granted. You don't, you don't think about all of the things around you. You don't think about, you know, the beautiful plants on the way to the bus stop. You don't think about the cracks in the pavement. You're just trying to get to the bus. But when you're traveling, you're sort of in this new space and you're forced to take in all of this information. So I agree 100%. You, travel is, is fundamental uh, to good design. I think that you don't have to travel far. You can go just to a neighboring city if, if maybe you don't have the time or the money to travel internationally, that's fine. You know, you can go on a hike somewhere outside of, you know, where you live. I, it doesn't take much, but I agree 100%. Traveling is, is by far one of the best things you could ever do for your design. I really like one word that you just said, which is forced. You are forced to do something you are you know you end up having to get out of your comfort zone and figure things out and i think there's something really important within a design and a creative process which is um the constraints that you need to have to be able to produce something really creative right so let's talk a little bit about that what do you think about the necessary constraints around the project, around an idea, so that you end up becoming more creative. Is it going to be for children? Is it going to be for adults? Is it going to be for like uh, blind people? Um, so there's always kind of like these things that you need to be able to form the, a project. But there, are there any other artificial constraints that maybe you build within your process to make sure that you move faster or become more creative? So in terms of how I like to move faster, I like to basically have a written goal uh, that is actually shared with the rest of the team in order to ensure that everybody agrees with a direction, basically. When you write it down and you talk about it, it takes all of the ambiguity out of it because, you know, um, Words can be interpreted in a lot of ways, but if you write it down and are very precise about how you discuss it, there's a lot less up for interpretation. So I think that's one thing that's really, really important when you're designing, making sure that everybody understands and agrees with the chosen direction and that that di direction makes sense. Like you were saying, like if you're designing a baby product, it probably doesn't make sense to um, make it out of like metal spikes. Um, <laughs> I know that's probably a more obvious example. Like you probably want it to be soft and rounded and it needs to be certain materials that are food safe so that, you know, in case the baby tries to eat it or something, it can't choke on anything. So all of those things are a given. But in addition to that, there are sort of like these intangibles that I think need to be articulated. So like another way to think about it is, okay, these are the hard requirements, but, you know, what do we want this uh, parent and this child to feel when they use this object, like what's it going to help them do? I think that's really important because then you can say, okay, uh, we want it to do this thing and anything that does not fit within that criteria, you can take out and anything that does, you keep in. So it takes a lot of subjectivity out of the process because now you have this agreed upon sort of set of standards that you're all using. So that's what I would say to that. I think just having like a set criteria so that you can decide like what what is a good design in this context. I think that's really, really important. You said something really important here is like, what are they going to feel? What do you want this person to experience? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe you wouldn't talk about how 
people are going to feel um, with somebody that you don't know very well yet. So what I mean by that is if you're on a team, like I, I'm speaking from a freelancer's perspective, I'm not going to talk to an engineer, a mechanical engineer about like the touchy feely stuff. I'm going to keep that to myself. I'm going to design for it, but unless I know that the engineer understands what I'm talking about, it's just going to go right over his head because, you know, he or she is focused on, you know, saving costs, simplifying parts, making sure that the assembly is not overly complex, uh, meeting the price targets, uh, making sure that it's feasible, maybe ensuring that it's not dangerous. These are all very, very important things. And if you sort of distract them with like this touchy feely stuff, number one, they're just going to look at you like you're insane. And number two, it's going to distract them from, from their goals. So anytime I'm presenting to an engineer, I tend not to talk about that stuff. Um, I'm not saying that it's not important, but it's just like, they don't, that that's not really what concerns them in the project. And I think knowing your audience is really important as a designer, whether you're like, so it's important to know your customer, but it's also important to know who you're speaking with in that moment and what it is that they care about and what's important to them, I think. Yeah, definitely. Communication is something really important when it comes to a creative process and, and doing design work. Let's talk a little bit about that. There's different types of people involved in the creation process, right? So how, how do you deal with that? How, you know, what are your tricks? What are your tools? Um, what are the challenges that you're still facing? So it might not come as a surprise to you, but I like to really try and understand what their profession is and what their concerns are within the project. Like what's their agenda basically? A agenda is sort of like, it has a negative connotation, but I don't mean it as a negative thing. Like what, what is the engineer's concern? Um, the better I understand what it is that they care about, the more easily I can address it. And the more easily I address their concerns and what it is that they care about in this project, the more likely they are to listen to my concerns. So I always really try and listen and understand exactly what it is that they're trying to do so that there's no ambiguity around their motivations and intentions. I can address those concerns and then they're going to be much, much more likely to listen to me if I have some weird touchy feely requests mm -hmm. that they don't fully understand, but they'll sort of trust me on it and say, well, you know, John really has taken the time to understand where I'm coming from. So I should try and understand what he is saying as well. And how, how is this communication happening? Is it, is it mainly around drawings and words? Is it calls? Like what are like, let's get down to like the, the actual nitty gritty of what happens when you're communicating. Let's say, let's put two examples and maybe they're going to be different. One is with the engineers. How are you communicating with them? But how are they communicating with you as well? But then on another side and another very different person might be the end, um, the end client, the person that has kind of like commissioned you to, to do something. Well, I know that the easiest way that I can do this is to put you on the spot. So let me ask you, <laughs> what is your intention with Gravity Sketch? Our intention with Gravity Sketch is to enable people to create, communicate and express ideas spatially. Spatially. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Let's see, are there more, is there, is there a sort of method that you've experimented with? Like, how did you arrive at VR? I mean, I think it's a really, really great idea. I'm just curious to hear about how you arrived at it, your process. We set out to essentially enable people to materialize their ideas in the quickest and most intuitive way. That was the starting point. And for us, it was a really long process. Well, three month process actually, like, yeah to really understand what was going on in people's minds when they were going through a creative process. Um, so we research, uh, you know, the, the, the regular creative people, uh, like designers and architects and so on. But then we also um, started to analyze how other different types of people were trying to communicate. People in marketing, um, you know, business people, all the way to dancers, like creating the, their dance moves. And through all of the, this research, we got to um, like to a series of insights that would lead us to 
create hypotheses that would be experimented through experiments, like very, very low-tech experiments, really no-tech experiments. So we were not thinking about VR, AR, or like how do we you know, use these technologies. We were thinking how do we enable people to create in an intuitive way. And one of the experiments was really, like really insightful, which was this layers cube. Um, it was a cube of, of acrylic that would have different types of, uh, different layers of acrylic. You would ask someone to think about the shape, uh, slice it, draw the different slides on the cube, and then put it back together, move it around, and they would see the shape that they had in their head in a very rough way, but in a really quick way, they were able to, ex to express it. Um, and the experiment was really successful, so we thought, okay, let's make it bigger so people can you know, create like, even better things. Then it ended up being super cumbersome, big, heavy, lots of layers, and we thought, what if you only needed one layer of acrylic? You would sketch on that layer, and then if you would move the layer in space, the sketch would stay floating in space, but then you would be able to move that layer somewhere else in space and continue sketching. And that's when we brought augmented reality into the picture because we said, okay, actually you can do it, right? We have the technology now to see digital things floating in space. And that, that was how it came to be. So, and that's one of the reasons why Gravity Sketch has been able to stay true to what it is like in, initiated as. It's because we were really clear in what our design purpose was and what our design principles and pillars are, um, as opposed to just thinking about, we have this technology, what do we do with it? So yeah, that was, that's the story of how Gravity Sketch was created. Okay, so I just took some notes and, and tell me if I'm understanding this correctly. You mentioned the importance of expressing an idea quickly and intuitively in physical space ideally. And you didn't just look at AR and VR, you looked at dancing, gestural motions, everything. And the first experiment was basically this cube experiment where you took slices of a cube and you drew a certain profile on each, or, or a line on each uh, level of, of this sliced cube. And then you sort of get a general uh, understanding of a three-dimensional object. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then you were very clear in your design purpose and pillars because you started with your intention first you didn't just say like, oh, we have this AR headset or VR headset, uh, what do we do with this? Is that also correct? Yeah. Okay. So that's basically what I do. Uh, this is like sales 101, but it it's not like really, sales also has sort of a negative connotation, but if you look at any sort of sales book, the key thing is to understand where the person that you're speaking with is coming from. So you'll notice that I repeated the question, I repeated back to you what you said basically as a question in order to ensure that I really understood what you were saying. And you probably felt kind of nice because it's like, oh wow, this guy took notes. He took the time to really listen to me and I know that he's listening to me because he repeated back to me what I said to him and he was right. So that is basically it. Um, another thing that I was very careful of was that I tried to avoid, uh, when I, I said, how did you come up with this idea? People can get defensive. So I made sure to make it very clear that I thought it was a good idea. I wasn't judging them. That's really important. When you ask these questions, you don't want it to feel like it's a trial. You want it to feel much more natural because uh, I'm genuinely curious about what, like how you came up with Gravity Sketch. So that's basically what I would do. And then I would maybe ask some other follow-up questions like, um, what is your personal interest with Gravity Sketch? I mean, you know, I bet you that you have to answer that question that I gave you a lot, but what do you, and I know that this is not the best context because we're publicly discussing it, but what do you really want to do with Gravity Sketch? Like, what do you really, really want to do with it? What do we want to do with it is enable people to create and communicate. That's, that's it. And it's there's so many different things happening right now um, within Gravity Sketch. Our community is growing so much. You know, we're being able to like penetrate different markets and so on. But the most important and the most interesting part of our whole uh, journey and our lives throughout doing Gravity Sketch is really just seeing how people use it, 
how people are just being able to completely transform the way that they work. And that for us, like whenever we see that, that's what's, what makes us wake up every morning and be really excited about, you know, continuing to, to swim against the current always uh, and make Gravity Sketch happen. You mentioned transforming the way that they work. So it's not really about you. It's about how you can enable other people to create. Is that correct? Yeah, 100%. That's awesome. That is really interesting. One other thing that you mentioned was, was looking at dancing. And I think this is worth mentioning. I don't know if you have a dancing background or anything. I don't, I don't dance very well. I try. Mm -hmm. But um, basically, I, I think that there's something to be said about gravity sketch in terms of the physiological movements that you're engaging in, which enable you, which enable you to be much more creative. So when you're doing 3D CAD, you're sort of like hunched over and you're sort of looking at this screen and it's not like this posture is not conducive to creativity. Like this, when you're like looking up at a VR headset and using these big, huge gestures, that is much more creative. And I, I think that one of the thing that makes, or one of the things that makes Gravity Sketch a really amazing program is the fact that it's so freeing and open and so just enjoyable to use. I think that's really, really underrated in design. Like if you're enjoying what you're doing in, you know, Gravity Sketch, it is a lot easier to come up with good concepts. It's a lot easier to iterate. Whereas in CAD, you're in this like posture, it's very regimented. Um, you sort of have to have a system for how you're going to build the object. You can't really, you can kind of iterate in it and you know, some softwares are parametric, but it doesn't enable the same level of freedom and flexibility that Gravity Sketch does, which is why I sincerely believe that this is the future of design. I don't know if it's going to be like replacing CAD. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but when it comes to just coming up with iterations in a free and expressive way, almost like dancing in this very gestural way, I think that's going to be absolutely revolutionary. And I, I'm starting to integrate it into my process. I think I sent you some images of the stuff that I've been experimenting with. So in Gravity Sketch, one thing that's really easy to do is just make a giant scribble um, that's all crazy. And then you can immediately turn it into an object. You can do that in CAD. You can, uh, like Rhino especially, but it would be much, much slower. It's, it's not nearly as intuitive. It's not nearly as iterative. And I think that's one thing that's really interesting about Gravity Sketch, the ability to do these super organic shapes. And then if you combine it with something else, which is something that I did, I combined it with uh, some algorithmic generative, generative designs that I did in Houdini, that is where things get really interesting. So I've just sort of started with Gravity Sketch and I've already done some crazy stuff that I never would have been able to create under normal circumstances. So thank you for making such a great application. I appreciate it very much. Oh, thank you for like telling me all of that. That's what I mean. It's at the end of the day, um, we're just creating a tool, but who makes it come to life is the, per the people that are using it like yourself. And yeah, I've seen, I've seen those uh, different designs that you've been creating and they're crazy amazing. So, and you're just getting started, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So those were like very experimental. Um, that, like, I don't know if that has any utility. Like, it's just like these weird blobby abstract shapes, but that's how it starts. You got to start with something a little bit weird and nobody's going to pay me to do this. So I just have to do it on my own. And then eventually somebody, w once I find an application for it or somebody else finds an application for it, that's when it's going to click. And it's already happened with other projects that I've done. I've done weird stuff in Houdini and I didn't think anybody was going to pay me for it. But meanwhile, here I am. I, it was one of my biggest contracts last year. So you just have to have faith in, in yourself and, and your process and, and just really take the time to explore these new, new programs. Because it's so easy to say like, oh, well, you know, I have this, I have this established workflow. I do my sketches. Um, I'll maybe go into Procreate and clean them up a little bit to present them to a client. And then we go into CAD, then we go into Keyshot and render it. Then we go back and do some iterations in Rhino. And you know, it's a process that works, 
But if you wanna really push yourself as a designer, you need to start using these other new applications. Otherwise, you're just gonna fall behind. And Gravity Sketch is 100% the future. I can say that with total confidence. VR sketching is the future. There's no doubt in my mind after having used it for just a little bit, I know it's, it's gonna be the future. You need to integrate Gravity Sketch into your workflow because it will save you so much time it will make you a better designer. It will allow you to express your ideas more organically and freely. And I, once again, I'm not getting paid. <laughs> this is just, these are my opinions. So please use Gravity Sketch. Um, you should totally use it. I think it'll help you out a lot. And uh, you know, it's not hard to pick up. Everything that you've been uh, talking about, it makes me think about, and we can, we can finish with this question, which can end up being a really long one, um, which is, your design philosophy. I was reading about it and I really connected with it because at the end is how we think about, um, you know, products and tools, right? Like products and tools should be um, just an extension of yourself, almost making them invisible, right? So that you carry on with your life. Tell us a little bit about that. That's pretty much exactly it. And maybe that's why I like Gravity Sketch so much because it's so in line with my personal design philosophy. So I design a lot of wearables and medical devices and things where you interact with them with your hands quite a bit. I've, I seem to have fallen into that because it's something that just really interests me. And basically my philosophy is that, like you said, tools should be an extension of the body. They shouldn't require so much conscious articulation and thought to execute an action. Like you don't want to uh, be like the goal isn't to do VR sketching necessarily. The goal is to come out with a design that's amazing and hasn't been seen before and, and solves a real human problem. So if you think of it from that perspective, um, that's basically the philosophy in a nutshell. And I think gravity sketch accomplishes that really well. And I think that's why I like it so much. Um, my goal is not to necessarily to cre it's not always to design something that like really stands out and is crazy. Although I do tend to post that kind of stuff online because it's sort of my chance to sort of flex. But when it comes to my professional work, I tend to be much more modest in my design approach. I tend to be much more humble and it's like, how do I help this person achieve mastery in the activity they're engaging in? So, I'm sure that you think about this all the time. Like, how do I enable this designer to achieve mastery in their process and in their craft? And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's, that's really what it's all about. And you can see that everywhere. I mean, you have to think about how much, how valuable that is to somebody to be able to do something that they love or to, to be able to save somebody's life or help to aid in saving somebody's life by creating a, a, a product that enables that. So here's an example. Um, I designed, I helped design this product called ElectroSpit. And it's basically this, it's like this musical instrument that fits around your neck as these two little headphones here. And I'm not gonna go into, into too much detail about how it works and everything, but I was the industrial designer on the project. I worked with some incredibly talented mechanical and electrical engineers. Uh, the founder, Bosco Conte, is a Grammy-winning musical artist, and he actually invented the idea. And I think I, I saw a video of Bosco on stage, and he had sort of revealed this instrument to the audience for the first time. And he just starts playing it on stage, and there's a bunch of other people on stage. They'd never seen it before, and they're just staring at him like absolutely awestruck because he's like playing this thing like crazy. It's, it, it's, if you see it, I'll try and find the clip. It's absolutely insane. And then, you know, there's like the drop for the beat in the music and the entire crowd just erupts and everybody's freaking the fuck out. And I was like, okay, I had a very small part in that. I helped Bosco to basically express his musicality and look at all the good that it's doing for the people in the audience. Look at how much joy it's bringing them. And I think that is probably uh, one of the most fulfilling things you could possibly do. So I can definitely understand how Gravity Sketch has helped you with that. Like you get to see these people create these amazing things every day that you could never have imagined. Yeah, they just take it to the next level, like everyone, you, you included. 
Um, John, all right, so we're, we're getting to the end of, um, of the podcast, but I think it would be a great um, opportunity for you to talk a little bit about the program that you are working on. You are going to start this um, course. So it's basically about understanding the fundamental principles of industrial design, how to analyze products, apply it to your own work, how to derive inspiration from the world around you in like this very like systematic process driven way so that you can just get a better portfolio and get a job, communicate the value of your designs to clients and basically just become a better industrial designer. So um, we can leave a link in the description if you want to learn more about it. Uh, you can also check out my channel Design Theory on YouTube. It's got almost 11,000 subscribers now. Um, just a month ago, it was at only about 116. So it's grown very quickly. And uh, yeah, go check out Design Theory. There's a ton of free videos on there. I would encourage you to check out that first. And then I haven't launched the course yet, but we can leave a link. Basically, if you're interested, you can get notified. But check out Design Theory first because there's a ton of free stuff on there and you can learn a lot from that too. And see if, see if the course is for you maybe after that if, you're, if you really like it. Yeah, his channel is awesome. I didn't know that it grew so fast so quickly. Congrats. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, John, for your time and for like telling us everything about your design process and life and, and everything. And also for being such a cheerleader for Gravity Sketch. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun.